All right, everyone, good afternoon and welcome. On behalf of Strategic Retirement Partners, I want to thank you for joining us for today's event, Safer Online. My name is Sarah Kraypeck, and I'm the Director of Participant Education with Strategic Retirement Partners, joined by uh, our, my colleague and friend from Invesco, Jay Therian, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items as usual. All the lines are muted uh, during the event today, but we really do welcome your questions and invite you to be interactive. Please feel free to type them into uh, the Q&A that you see in the bottom panel of the Zoom screen, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. We do expect our session to last about 45 minutes today. So a couple things that you can expect from today's session. First, we wanna give you the truth about cybersecurity, and we are not going to shy away from things that might be a little fearful or worrisome, but we just wanna lay out the, the realities of what we're all dealing with here. Uh, second, we wanna give you some key takeaways and practical advice for real life. Before our session concludes today, I'll tell you what I ordered off Amazon after dry running this presentation with Jay last week. It's an item I realized I never knew I needed, but will never again live without. So I can also promise some stories from Jay, uh, colorful real life examples of um, the threats and things that we all need to be aware of. And then I do want everyone to walk away with some retirement plan specific tips on how to keep your retirement savings as secure as possible. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jay Therian um, from Invesco. He is a senior director and executive consultant with the Invesco Global Consulting Division. His areas of specialty include communications, practice management, team leadership, adult learning behaviors. He is a keynote speaker and executive coach, as well as an author. Jay is the proud dad to three daughters. He is the leader of a music nonprofit um, in Springfield, Massachusetts, as well as a sports enthusiast who is probably still in a good mood after Sunday's uh, outcome. So um, I'll tell you that Jay speaks from experience on the topic of identity theft, and hopefully his experience will help spare us some of uh, the same uh, inconvenience that he had to go through. So with all that said, thanks again for joining and I'm gonna turn it over to Jay um, to start screen sharing and walk us through uh, the presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good day, everyone. I normally say good morning or good afternoon and then I realize sometimes folks are in different time zones. So we'll just say good day. Um, so, and, and I'm always, I always listen, love listening to, uh, friends and colleagues, you run through my bio cause it makes me feel really good. Um, you know, as we move into the midweek of living through yet another day or month inside of a pandemic. And as I get to broadcast live from my, uh, home office here in Massachusetts and to Sarah's point as an avid sports enthusiast, you see the Patriots helmet likely off in the distance, the guitars, pictures of my kids, all kinds of fun stuff. Some of those stories may come out today. Um, because, uh, as I always used to joke, for those of you to get the reference, I'm not only the hair club for men president, I'm also a client. I've had a lot of these security challenges that I've had to overcome personally and within my family and my close network of friends and colleagues. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of those personal experiences today. And, and Sarah is going <laughs> to jump in a, a more than a few occasions here because she too um, has had some some recent experiences and, and things that her family is working with. So I'm excited to, to share some of this with you today. Um, before we jump into cybersecurity and identity theft, I think it's important to really take a step back and think about why are we, why, what are we looking at here, right? Like what is, what is the core for cybersecurity and, and identity theft protection? And really it all comes down to building a solid foundation. If you look at essentially what what measures or is very closely aligned with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, we have our basic necessities at the foundation there, right? Clothing, housing, transportation, uh, I'm sorry, and education. And then we move up into some of those desires, the travel, the entertainment, the luxury, where I know a lot of us likely on this webinar um, are living our best lives um, in the midst of 
of this pandemic, right? And then ultimately, what's the legacy? What's the future that we want to give back to the world? And how do we want ourselves and our family members? And as Sarah had mentioned, I run a non-for-profit music school as a musician. That's very important to me. So all of those things inside of the Therian family um, are, are you know, part of our story arc. And then on the right-hand side of this is, you know, we need those emergency funds and really that protection against catastrophe to be there. If we don't have that solid base of that foundation, our current needs and our future goals are in jeopardy, right? I mean, you think about from an investment perspective and, and how we move up in terms of accumulation of wealth and protection, whether it be through retirement or other assets, um, we spend lives, literal lives, building what we want to have happen and, and aligning that financially. And if we don't insulate and protect that core foundation, the rest of this pyramid comes crashing down. I'm sure you've all received those emails from the Nigerian prince that has an unbelievable business proposition for you. And while I hope most of us don't fall for that, um, there's certainly a number of challenges that exist in today's marketplace. I wanna share with you some statistics as we go through this, and I don't do this to scare anyone whatsoever. I do it to prove the point that this is a lot more of an issue than most folks are aware of. And the good news is Sarah and I are gonna share with you some things that you can do to protect yourself and your family members, those you care about, and then also some, some uh, opportunities to remediate or, or mitigate any potential risks or unwind any challenges that may come up. Um, so as we're living through this unprecedented time, this global pandemic, no surprise, for, I'm not going to win a Nobel Prize for pointing out that we've all spent a whole lot of time on our electronics, on laptops, I'm staring at another blinking light, talking to a piece of plastic that then gets transmitted to all of you, which I'm fortunate and blessed to do that and go upstairs and hug my kids and chat with them on this snowy snow day here of virtual learning in Massachusetts. But that also means that because more information is traveling through that virtual pipeline, we're susceptible to risk. And recent statistics done through Interpol, which is a real agency, it doesn't actually just exist in James Bond and James Bourne movies uh, and other spy films. Uh, the International Policing Association has said that there is approximately a 569% increase in cybercrime in the midst of this pandemic. Almost 600% increase in cybercrime activity. That number goes all almost up to 800 if you factor in those high risk registrations. And we'll talk about what that means, where people are trying to, to, to lever, leverage your information, but unsuccessfully, you know, for whatever reason, they are thwarted and stopped. So it's a massive, massive increase in activity here. So how can we all be smarter and protect ourselves and those we care about? How big of a problem is identity theft? Um, you know, 16.7 million Americans were victims to identity theft, over oh, close to $17 billion worth of financial losses inside of our country. Um, on average, we're looking at about $1,000 loss per victim. Um, and those victims spend on average of nine hours to, uh, to recover from some of those identity theft consequences. And quite frankly, it happens at a rate of about two victims per second. So if we do the math for all of you that are on the line here, again, I hope and pray that none of you are victim to this right now, but think about all the people around the country, just in our country, not even across the world, just in the United States that are falling victim to this over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, now these statistics are from 2018 and I was sharing with Sarah earlier um, as we were preparing, my team is currently updating these statistics. Again, given the Interpol stats and some of the work we're doing with local field offices of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies and, and protection, cyber protection agencies, we think those numbers are going to significantly ramp up. Um, cautiously optimistic that maybe they didn't get as bad as we think they did, but given the amount of traffic and crime right now, um, would stand to reason that we're gonna see these statistics climb. So let's just walk through a quick hypothetical scenario. Remember when we used to be able to go to restaurants and bars safely? Those were good times. Um, and let's just say Sarah and I are out, we, we get together, I'm, I'm out there and, and we can just chat and we say, you know, let's go get a glass of wine um, and, and kind of kick back and talk about this amazing presentation we did for our clients. And we're sitting there and I take my wallet out and I put it on the bar and we have a glass of wine and then another glass of wine. And the next thing I know, I can't find my wallet. My wallet's gone, right? Um, 
my wallet is stolen by some real smooth criminal, not the Michael Jackson kind, a, a more uh, you know menacing kind, of course, because I mean, look at me. You know, he's going to come and steal my wallet. He's got to be prepared for a fight, right? But regardless of that, my driver's license is in there. My credit cards are in there. And the average American carries four credit cards in their wallet, okay? My insurance card is in there because, of course, if anything were to happen while I'm traveling, I mean, my friend Sarah will make sure I'm taken care of and gets me to the right place. But once I get there, they're going to want to make sure that I have insurance. My Social Security card was in there, okay? I have probably now, if, if the situation was reversed, or maybe I had a travel bag or maybe Sarah had her purse stolen, there's an opportunity that cell phone could have been in there, checkbook, right? Think about all the things that we typically carry on our person when we're just out in the world. And when those things are compromised and stolen, every piece of data that's needed to open an account under your uh, or a profile under your name is obtained inside of there. They've got your first name, They've got the name on your credit card. So if you have a middle initial, it's likely on one of those cards, right? Um, your email address could be on any of the correspondence in there, could be on your cards, any of your identifying information, um, date of birth, your phone number, your home address, et cetera. So they have the vast majority of what's required to at least create a profile to try to mimic or clone your identity or gain access to your accounts. Think about if you were carrying your, your social security card or anything in there has your social security number on it. Um, most states have moved away or moved away from using your social security number as your driver's license ID, but not all, right? So depending on the state of issuance, that number could still likely be your social security number. Um, if, if you have that or you have a Medicare card, they have that information. Thieves always have creative ways to tricking you into providing social security numbers too. So even if your wallet isn't stolen, think about all the ways that this information is constantly mined or potentially taken advantage of online. And all of these can be leveraged to create that identity theft profile and or crack the code to gain access to your accounts. One of the most common things that we see is, oh, I forgot my password, okay? So somebody gets a hold of your uh, an email address or a company listing or what have you, or they just guess and they pull this blanket, you know, emails down. When a lot of these data breaches happen, folks are automatically concerned with the credit card information, but they don't realize that if it was an online order, we've got your name, your address, your, um, you know, some of your pertinent information that could potentially lead to some of these security answers. And more often than not, um, any of those data breaches could include some personally identifiable, identifiable information or what I like to call PII. You'll hear me reference that a number of times today, um, which will typically be the most common ones are like, what's your mother's maiden name? What's your father's middle name? What street, street did you grow up on? Where did you go to high school or college? What was the mascot? What are the last four digits of your social security number? Now, while you may think, wow, a lot of this stuff is somewhat protected, I want you to stop and think how many of you have played those, what Disney princess am I? By the way, I'm Jasmine. What, what Disney princess am I game? What's my, what's your, what was the number one song on your date of birth? What was the uh, favorite, what's your ideal house location? Which is gonna ask you questions about the type of house you grew up in. All of these things seem like very simple, common, innocuous, unharming quizzes, fun ways to pass the time. And people who I know who I've actually delivered some of this content with and or some of my family members, my dad's like, hey, guess what kind of Ferrari I am? I'm like, the kind that just gave away its information, dad. What are you doing? Why are you participating in these things? These are socially engineered more oftentimes than not. I'm not saying 100% of the time more oftentimes than not to get you to give up leads into that personally identifiable information. So think through that, be smarter when you're on those, the technology, especially in any social engagement, social engineering app, social um, you know, platforms like Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, um, any of those sorts of things where there's links and you can play these games or, or create additional um, levels of of information that you're just sharing with them, unbeknownst to you, could be used to, uh, against you later on. Um, who's most at risk for identity theft? Children under the age of 19, which is alarming to most folks when I give that statistic. They are the number one target 
of identity theft. Why? They're 51 times more likely to become uh, victims than adults because they don't typically accrue a credit history until later in life. This gives thieves years and years to rack up on debt. I'm going to share with you a personal story in a few moments um, of someone I care deeply about. They're as close to a family member as, as you can be without blood relation. And, um, and, and they had a very serious issue on their hands for a number of years. Um, number two, senior citizens. Um, why? Not because of any, you know, anything other than the fact that they typically have larger nest eggs. They will carry very little debt based on their time and their life cycle. They've likely paid off their homes. They've put their children through college. They're spoiling themselves, their grandkids, their children, you name it, right? Um, they don't typically, more often than not, based on our research, check credit reports as much because it's not as important to them. They're not using credit. Um, and they can be at times more susceptible to phone scams or even online phishing activities, things that seem fairly harmless and, and innocuous can oftentimes become very challenging. Um, victims of direct theft, folks who had their wallet stolen, their purse is stolen, your home was broken into, of course, no surprise there. A lot of folks um, were, were dealing with the local field office for the Federal Bureau of Investigation um, to update a lot of this content. And they were like, they were saying, you know, it's, it's alarming sometimes how many home invasions or home thefts or vehicle thefts, and people say, but nothing was stolen. Well, was nothing really stolen? Or were they after your information and not necessarily the flat screen TV that was on your wall? Because I can carry your PII in my pocket without anybody knowing, but I can't carry your 80 inch flat screen across the town of Longmeadow without somebody calling the police, right? And then residents of Florida, California, Nevada and the District of Columbia seem to be at highest risk. Um, we do see an older resident age, which may play a factor there. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of folks wanna live there. You think about Florida, California, um, great warm places, you know, great year round climates, Nevada, a lot going on, especially if you're in entertainment. Um, DC, obviously, with the influence there between arts, politics, etc. Um, so just higher mass degree of population leads to higher instances of, of potential security risks. Um, we think about hey, the Jay, types of, Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I want to pop in with a question here. Um, yeah. Because I, I got one coming through with the chat. Me having young kids myself was, I was alarmed to learn that kids can be victims of identity theft. And one of the questions that came through, and I hope you don't mind me um, yeah, kind no. of interrupting the flow here, but okay. how can we tell if a minor has had their ID stolen? What avenue or tools do you use to even determine if they've been compromised? We are, we are heading there right now, actually. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, so not to steal my own thunder, but we will answer, if I don't answer that question in the next three minutes, let's readdress it. Cause yeah, that's exactly where we're headed. Got it. Perfect. Um, so real, just quick, there's multiple types of identity theft. There's financial, which makes sense, right? Uh, account numbers, credit card numbers, et cetera. And then there's non-financial. So we need to be really specific of the types of identity theft that are happening and cyber crime that's happening. Um, two thirds of the overall instances of, of crime are actually non-financial in nature, but they do lead to some significant losses as we've seen earlier. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want to jump right into it. But, you know, we've got everything from medical theft, using your medical coverage or insurance information to, um, to provide false coverage and claims on behalf of someone else. Identity cloning, where somebody literally creates a clone of your information and operates as you. It's not like some shadow government uh, secret plot in movies, but it's pretty darn close. Synthetic identity, so they assume all aspects, but under a different social security number, usually one or two digits off. I'm going to share a personal story there in a second. Um, employment theft, where they can steal wages or retirement earnings using your social security number or your, your account info. Children identity theft, which is exactly where we're going to drive the lane. Theft occurring to children under 18 years of age, and then, of course, criminal fraud, um, providing your info during arrest, court hearings, et cetera. So a um, couple of things, just when we think about financial identity theft, we think about bank fraud, mortgage fraud, tax fraud. Um, there's a number of, of cases and examples we're going to share with you in a moment that cover this, which is what most folks gravitate towards when they think about identity theft and cybercrime. They think about the financial aspect of it. Um, but more, most interestingly enough, um, what I wanted to really jump into, and I'm glad you asked the question, Sarah, because that is an alarming statistic. It's the number one thing that we've seen. Um, this was a shock to me. Now, I have three beautiful children, uh, 16, 
13 and eight. And I share those because you can't really do much with their ages, right? I didn't give you their names, social security numbers, but um, three beautiful young children. And a close friend of mine had his child's, uh, what they didn't know, unbeknownst to them, uh, went off and was going to college and was applying for schools and was applying for loans and credit and things to kind of bring her into the, you know, transition into adulthood, transition off to college, provide some security, obviously, where they would co-sign for things and they would open accounts together, but get her really in the in the realm of managing money and how money makes money, et cetera, et cetera, and leveraging Uncle Jay to help in that regard, given all my experience. And the admissions office came back and said, well, you know, certainly based on uh, this individual's credit history, there's no need for financial aid. They have a $600,000 mortgage outstanding. And my friend was like, excuse me? Um, yeah, there's also $5,000 worth of credit card debt against your daughters. Uh, you're, you're not aware of this? We're impressed that an 18-year-old girl could take out a $600,000 plus mortgage. Her credit had been compromised. Her identity had been stolen. And this had gone on for years and years and years because, again, children are issued social security numbers at birth. Yet none of us as parents or caregivers tend to think, oh, I better check my eight-year-old daughter's credit report. Um, so we don't monitor those things. And again, it's almost like I made the joke with Sarah earlier. It's like starting a high-performance vehicle, leaving the key in the ignition while it's running, rolling all the windows down right out in your driveway and just going to the house and locking the door, turn the other direction. Like you can just, it's just wide open for the taking, right? Um, and, and that's a core challenge. So we, of course, I intervened and helped them overcome some of these challenges, connected them with the right folks. And it took years to unravel what seemed like a very simple thing. How could my daughter at the age of 13 have taken out a mortgage? I mean, well, it's on her social security number. Somebody had her information. Um, so it obviously happened. Now, of course, this is insane. You would think there are laws and things to protect this, but it happened. It got through the system somehow and it became a massive financial headache for this for this family. So how can you prevent that from happening? And we'll, this is, we talk about this a little later on. First and foremost, there are free credit reporting agencies. You can go to any of the big three, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. You can sign up for annual credit reports. That's one of your rights as an American citizen and, and as, a, as an individual who has personally identifiable information due to all the data security breaches that have happened in the last five years. Um, not only for yourself, make sure you're doing it for your children, your grandchildren, anyone you're giving care to that may be underage. It sounds insane, but you need to monitor their credit as well because finding this as quickly as possible will help you take action and rectify it. Um, I don't, and I have to say this, especially because we're doing this and broadcasting it, I don't endorse any of these products directly. I do not get paid for endorsement. I'm not a paid advertiser whatsoever. I'm giving you what I've seen as best practices. Credit Karma is a fantastic resource. It's free. It has an app that if, and I can set parameters, if anything happens at a certain threshold on any of the identities for myself, my, my children, even my wife, it can all pop immediately and I have notification to that. Um, anything you can do to monitor that, I'm not saying you have to check it on a monthly basis or a weekly basis. Go into those where you get those free reports, set those notifications so the minute activity pings, especially on a minor, you're notified immediately and you can get in front of that before because we all know when those inquiries hit, especially on a thing like Credit Karma, they notify you. I just recently went through purchasing a vehicle I didn't even leave the finance office and I had a notification that the inquiry had already hit. So long before the issue was, before the loan was issued and the deal was done, I was notified that there was an inquiry there. You'll know the minute there's an inquiry, you can intervene and clean up that identity. Um, because I don't want any one of you who are watching this or any one of your family members to have to go through the years of unraveling this that my best friend and his daughter did. Um, insanity. But again, proves to exactly why most of these accounts lie dormant and lie unchecked by parents, grandparents, caregivers. And it's just a wide open field of, of, um, of criminal activity just ripe for the picking. So Sarah, hopefully that, uh, I, I believe we, we addressed that, but uh, we can certainly, if there are more questions that come in, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go a little bit deeper into those things. Yeah, um, no, that's great. And, you know, so <laughs> this is, and just uh, on the lines of child identity theft, right? One in 10 children are victims of identity theft. So 10% of the social security numbers sampled 
um, in a Carnegie Mellon study um, should belong to minors with active credit files, which is just an alarming statistic. And um, we actually internally are, are updating some of those statistics and partnering with some folks to update those numbers because I think those numbers are going to jump up. Um, 77, 76% of that credit activity was actually fraudulent. Sometimes those uh, those hits, those inquiries, maybe of something pure, if they if the individual is technically a minor at the age of say 17, but is maybe going off to college, and, and there's inquiries and things there where you can transition in. Basically, if they're going out of state and they're no longer a minor there, so there are some instances where it could be valid, but three quarters of the time, over three quarters of the time, it was it was fraudulent. Um, and it's and again, it's likely to go unnoticed until the child attends college or attempts to open a credit account. Imagine if my friend's daughter decided to skip college and just went into the workforce and this had just continued on and on and she was either called into court for failure to pay or went on to start a family or buy a home or take out a loan of some sort and then this had just continued to amplify for years after um, would have been completely catastrophic in that regard. Um, tax fraud is another one, especially given the, the, the time of year that we're in. Um, I'll just share a quick story. My one of my closest friends and colleagues over the last 20 some odd years um, had his social security number and his tax information compromised. He and his wife um, had falsified tax returns on their behalf. Um, and it wasn't his his accountant hadn't even been notified of this until um, they went to file a few years back and the IRS basically came back and said, you've already filed. And by the way, there's an outstanding component of this. And, and we were like, wait a second, what? I've got all these years worth of documentation. I have a certified public accountant who's who's delivering our taxes that is you know, doing all this for us on our behalf. We're not even doing it on our own. We have this paper trail of everything that happens. He had everything he needed to lay out um, on the landscape of this. It took him two years to clean it up. Um, to overcome any you know potential penalties that he had to, you know lying out there because of course one year was a massive return a refund the other year was a massive uh, up you know uh, um, in in the other direction where they they were saying that 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 individual had owed um, and that's where there became a conflict in the system and you think about all the billions and billions of folks that have to go through that process and all those applications that are filed and all those returns that are filed it could take upwards of seven to 10 years for these things to become a challenge. Um, and uh, there are about 100 false returns um, in this case because there was a data breach that um, had been filed for roughly about $500,000 worth of bogus refunds. And again, the recovery time for things like this can vary. I can say in my friend and colleagues uh, instance, it took them the better part of two years to have this rectified. And not only did that did he have the stress and the anxiety of having to work with the IRS and his accountants and everything else to, to rectify this. It held up legitimate tax refunds to him and his wife and his family based on all the estate planning and retirement planning and tax planning they had done. Um, and he's at that phase in his life where he was utilizing those assets in other, in other areas and it was held up for the better part of two years. Um, all because his information had been compromised and, um, and, and it wasn't validated. So definitely a challenge there. Um, and when we think about, you know, just to skip back here, because I know we jumped over child identity theft, there's a couple of other things here. Medical fraud is definitely on the rise. Um, and this is where being a good human being, we all go, oh, that's terrible, right? Because we know that there are people all around the world that are hurting, that don't have access to healthcare. Um, but having your medical information, insurance information compromised can allow folks to leverage that to obtain healthcare, surgeries, you name it. Um, and there's a, a case actually of, of another, uh, this came out of one of the local field offices we were talking through of an individual who received $40,000 in hospital bills above and beyond the insurance coverage for surgery they never received. Uh, their information was compromised that was used by someone to obtain surgery and access to healthcare and their credit report was massively impacted. And of course this went out as a lien against them because it was $40,000 um, negatively impacted their credit report showed as a judgment against them, right? Uh, which went undetected initially. Uh, and then after getting like the fifth or sixth thing back from the insurance company, thinking it was a mistake, realizing there was an issue as they reached out, um, this took over two years for this individual to recover based on that, again, with, with proof, with evidence that it wasn't their fault, it wasn't them that was actually receiving and administering the treatment. 
um, and or their physicians that were administering the treatment still had to spend a number of, of years and time to, to uncover that, which could have been easily identified by monitoring their credit and monitoring some of their, their, their medical and insurance coverage. So best practice I give folks here, we all get it, regardless of who your insurance carrier is. Um, you know, we have Cigna and they have an app where every time I set a notification in there, anytime there's a claim filed against my myself or any of my dependents, my family, from an insurance perspective, I get a pop-up on the notification screen and I get an email with that explanation of benefits or the, the claim that was filed. Um, it seems excessive. However, anytime anything hits my insurance, I want to know about it because if something like this were to happen, I would have never been notified that I just received surgery last week and that a claim was filed in the upwards of $40,000 on my behalf. And I realized that I wasn't actually under the knife. Um, so you can get, you can get in front of these things a lot quicker. And then finally, the other thing that I'll just, as we start to transition into some of the other challenges, and I know there's, I see the blinking light, so there's lots of questions that are coming in the chat box, which is great. Um, identity cloning is a big challenge as well. Typically, folks can get your information um, and live under your identity, use it to get driver's license, government documents, employment, you name it. I'm going to share with you a personal story here. Uh, back when I was 16 years of age in the state of Connecticut, where I grew up, uh, my mother, God rest her soul, took me to get my, to, to do my, my driver's license uh, test and exam, right? So being the cocky 16 year old kid I was, I went in there, I aced it, I, you know, I crushed the driving. I think back to my oldest daughter, who's now in the same position and learning to drive and the difference in confidence versus cockiness is not lost on me. I was definitely in the latter. She is much more in the former, thank God. But um, so I got the license and I was all excited. And I was ecstatic and I was waiting in line because if anybody's been to the DMV, RMV, you name wherever you live, right? Um, you know, it's it's pretty close to what they depict in movies as the seventh layer of you know where. So I'm standing in this long line. My mom says, I'm going to go wait in the car. I love you. Congratulations. I'll see you when you come out. But what felt like four years later, I come out with my driver's license and I look down and they have made me a year older. And I was like, whoo, -hoo -hoo, yeah, all right. So as a 16 year old mischievous, you know, rock and roller, I was like, yeah, now I'm 17 instead of 16. This is amazing. Um, so my, I get in the car, my mom's like, show me the license. And I was like, oh, it looks like this. And she's like, no, let me see it. Like, I want to see my baby boy on his driver's. I'm like, mom, hey, hey, look. And I like, put my thumb over it. She's like, Jay, move your hand. Ah, good mom, right? Like all of you, I'm sure as parents, right? So I had to take my thumb. She's like, get your butt back in there. You were not 17 years of age. You were 16 years of age. Like, okay, mom. So I go back and I said, guys, it was a mistake. So ah, no problem. They take my license. They issue a new one. Fast forward about, oh, I don't know, 12 years. Um, I get an appearance, a summons appearance. I'm living in the state of Massachusetts. I moved out of Connecticut shortly after that, a few years later. Registered vehicles, purchased a home in Massachusetts, had nothing to do with Connecticut. Had surrendered my license years past, surrendered all my driver's plate, my uh, license plates, you name it, right? Never registered a vehicle, didn't own a home there, nothing. Get a summons to appear in court for excess charges and overages on a vehicle that was abandoned at a apartment I had rented, a vehicle I had never licensed, um, all these fraudulent charges, over $10,000 worth of fees, plus legal fees, et cetera, et cetera, to appear in the city, county uh, of Waterbury, Connecticut, to testify on my behalf, to bring a lawyer, whatever. I was like, what the heck is this? Call the RMV or, or state Massachusetts RMV. I had all my records, et cetera. The only thing we can deduct is that when I traded that license in, somebody at the DMV at the time was either selling bogus licenses or took it on their own. They used it to register a vehicle. They cloned my identity. They rented an apartment. They took out it. They opened accounts, you name it. And basically just said, forget all this and decided not to pay on it, defaulted on it. It all happened in Waterbury, Connecticut, apparently, where I never owned a home and quite frankly, hardly ever visited. And I spent... About 12 years later, I spent the better part of three days taking time off from work, I had to hire an attorney, all to fight these bogus trumped up charges that I had proof from the state of Massachusetts. I owned a home there. I had registered vehicles. I had surrendered my Connecticut license. The Connecticut Registry of Motor Vehicles had proof that I didn't live in the state and I surrendered my license 12 years ago, long before any of this happened. I still had to prove that I was not at fault cost this happens so so many times um more often than not with deceased family victims so when someone passes away um 
you know, the, their, their driver's license, any of their identifiable information can sometimes lay dormant or get passed along between generations of family. Um, I've had a local family I've worked with personally on some of these things that are like, oh, we thought it was cute to give grandma's, you know, you know, wallet to the grandkids and they were using it to play house and whatever else. And who knows what happened to the information that was in there. So something that seems very simple and harmless, even an expired license has enough information on it for somebody to clone your identity and make your life uh, really difficult going forward. So just a couple of quick things. And then I know Sarah will transition into some of the, the final comments and, and address a lot of the Q and A and the flashing lights I'm seeing on screen. Um, additional ways folks can steal your information. Of course, they can be direct theft. They can steal your wallet, your purse. They can break into your home. Um, mail theft. Do I have a, do I have a, a porch thief? Uh, who's casing the joint and stealing Amazon packages and mail coming up. Possibly it happens a lot of times, right? Um, dumpster diving. It sounds ridiculous, but if we don't properly dispose of this information and it ends up in a landfill somewhere, there are folks that go and hunt for these things because again, they want every shot on goal knowing that they're not going to have a high success rate. So they need to continue taking those, those shots. Um, so there's some definite challenges there. And then digital theft. This is obviously what's been on the rise. So hacking, someone breaks into your computer or compromises your account. Um, social engineering, and I've given some examples of those. The, you know, what Disney princess quiz are you is a famous one that a lot of folks are using right now. Or they will create these bogus emails, much like farming and fishing, where they'll ask you to log in, et cetera. Sometimes they'll say, you know, we'd like you to rate your client service experience. And based on where you called from, again, confirm your location, right? Like, not exactly asking you to log in, but socially engineering some of your information and location based on that to be very cautious of what you click on and what you share. Um, wireless theft and skimming, which are very similar to one another. Uh, this is where Sarah has a, a great personal story in the last, in the recent week or so. Uh, but I was sharing with her that wireless theft and skimming, one of the things that has protected us as cardholders is these RFID, they're called, radio frequency identification chips, where you can go up and you can, kind of cool, right? You can go up and you can just tap the register. You can just kind of bless the machine and say, I too allow you to accept payment. And then you put it back in your pocket. Um, makes our life easier, which is great. But it also opens us up to a lot of risk. There, uh, over in Europe since 2014, this has actually been a massive issue. And it's become more prevalent in the United States the last few years where folks actually have computer programs where they will sit in a bridge or in a park in a, in a very densely populated public area. And if you are within say 20 to 30 feet of their computer, they can actually skim and steal wirelessly the information that's on those cards. So all they have to do is sit in one place and pretend they're writing their favorite haiku uh, on a beautiful spring day. And as 10,000 people pass them in Central Park, over that course of time, they were able to steal a ton of information there. So there are some strategies that you can utilize and we'll talk about in a second to protect yourself there. Um, and then the obvious, shoulder surf, right? I mean, folks coming over your shoulder, if you're utilizing something, if you're sitting next to them, so privacy screens and um, what I always like to call my privacy screens are my left and right elbows. Um, as a former football player, I get a lot of motion this way. So not a lot of folks get too close to me. They're not gonna be getting information over my shoulders. Um, so when we think about how we protect ourselves, we're going to, we're going to transition into this and then we'll open up the Q and A and I'd love for Sarah to jump in. She's got some, not only some great stories here, but some recent stories. Um, yeah. so how do we prevent and help minimize the likelihood of theft? How do we detect it and how do we recover from it? So first and foremost, again, prevention, reducing our footprint. If it's something in print, read it, shred it, or store it. If you can go paperless, pretty much any bank, any financial institution, Quite frankly, anybody who has personally identifiable information, that PII, is legally required to offer you a paper opt-out because we know as a, as a country and as a Nate and as a world that cybersecurity is a real thing. So we have to reduce our footprint. Take advantage of that where you can. If you really feel you still need paper statements, I get it, right? I, I do in certain things. Lock them up in your safe. If you don't have a safe, get a lockbox, do something where if somebody were to gain access to your home or gain access to your personal space, that information is as protected as possible. Keep cards close to your vest. I would honestly say, if you carry cards at all, limit the number of credit cards that you're carrying. Again, the average American carries four cards. The George Costanza wallet, for those of you that are Seinfeld fans, it's funny, 
um, not only does it give you some thoracic spine issues from sitting on this giant wallet, if you're a man, right? If you're male, like I'm talking to my, my, my brothers out there um, who, who used to do that, myself included, right? Um, you're carrying around too much darn information. It's so easy and susceptible to being stolen. If that wall is compromised and leaves your possession, people could engineer probably multiple profiles off of you. Um, limit it to one or two cards at most. And quite frankly, if you have an iPhone or an Android device that has Samsung Pay or Apple Pay, this is a fantastic resource. What these do when you use this digital, for those of you that aren't familiar, when you use these digital payment methodologies, it creates a fake card number for that specific transaction. And once that transaction is processed, that number ceases to exist. So if you were part of, say, the famous Target data breach, and you went in and you bought yourself something nice and at Target, and then you used your debit card or your credit card, that number's in the database, that information was stolen. If it's an if it's an, uh, Samsung or an Apple Pay, they can get that information, maybe. And even if they do, it's gonna show up as declined because the card is dead, it's expired. Um, if the information has to be returned from the merchant, both of those technologies have reverse flow where even though the card isn't active, it allows you to put the money back into the actual account itself. I don't even carry credit cards anymore, quite frankly. I just use this. If I do have to carry one, I carry one actual credit card, not a debit card, because a debit card has a lot more access into your financial life. Credit card companies, all major companies, have thought, uh, theft and loss prevention detection and resources to immediately back that off while you dispute it. So if you do have to carry cards, make sure it's one, two max. If you really need to be super, if you need the belt and the suspenders for protection, two max. Make sure their credit cards, not debit cards. Uh, be less social on social media. Again, limit the personal information. I've beat this up. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. Um, think of others. Who in your household? Who in your family? Who in your community? I've shared this with my community members, folks that come to my music, the music school I help run, folks in my local community, my neighbors, my friends, folks, because while you think this is common sense to most people, it's not. And a lot of us don't have experience here, so share the information. Um, and control the electronics. Use strong passwords. Be careful of lost devices. Um, most devices will offer these what are impossible to remember combinations of numbers, letters, special symbols, dashes, characters. Um, the longer it is and the more complex it is, the harder it is to crack. So take advantage of those, even though they may be more difficult to remember. A lot of them can be stored and encrypted in devices or other platforms that allow you access much easier to log into those things. Um, and then just quickly, look for a red flags. I, I already beat this up. Check your credit report at least yearly. You get three free ones from each of the big three, or I'm sorry, one free one from each of the big three. And then leveraging things like Credit Karma is a great example that can monitor and give you instant notifications if anything changes. And be alert, you know, place those fraud alerts on credit reports, place them automatically on your cards. I mean, all of the major banks have, if you see a transaction over X dollar amount, send me a notification, do that. Um, you'll know if you're making large purchases. And quite frankly, what most folks don't think about is there's an under. If there's a transaction processed under $1.99, I get a notification. Why? Because most of these thieves, when they get your card information, they process a transaction for three cents, six cents, 98 cents, just to see if the card's active. Then they make the big purchase. If I go in and I'm using my card to buy a pack of gum, that's on me if I get a notification. I forgot the loose change. No big deal. I don't mind it. Um, that has saved me personally and my family at least three times from having our cards uh, compromised well beyond when we would have been notified. And then just really quick, recovery. Acting fast. Don't delay any of those reports and try to get these things uh, you know, ironed out. Clear your name of any criminal issues. So you can work with local and federal law enforcement agencies to file reports. The, federal, the FBI um, has a division that focuses on cybersecurity and identity theft. Leverage those resources. They are experts. They know exactly what to do, and they can give you a plan of exactly how to act to minimize the damage while you mitigate the outcome. Um, and then have a recovery plan. You can go to identitytheft.gov. It's a government resource, free to everybody, where you can actually build a recovery plan, identify your local resources, obviously replacing credit cards, et cetera. And, and again, consider, we say hiring a monitoring service. Most of them you don't even have to pay for, quite frankly. All the good ones are free, and you can certainly pay them if you choose to do so. Again, I'm just not an official endorsement, but um, there are great resources out there that you can take advantage of. 
So Sarah, I know you've got actually another great tip in terms of protection and recovery and, and a lot of what can take place there. And you've got some personal stories of things you've taken. So I'd love to just give you a few minutes before we jump into Q&A to talk about the personal impact and, and, and some of those stories uh, now before we jump into any remaining Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. And Jay, this has been great so far. I know everybody that we're running up against our 45 minute time frame, but if you have just a few minutes to stay with us, there are lots of great questions that we're gonna address. And just as a reminder, this presentation will be made available to all of you via SRP's YouTube page, and you'll be uh, emailed a link to the recording just as soon as we process it and get it through compliance this week. But um, in a weird twist of events, Jay, I can't even believe that this is real life, but yesterday, on my doorstep was delivered a FedEx envelope marked urgent that I thought was highly unusual. Uh, normally it's the Amazon truck going by, right? Um, so I pick it up and it is a distribution check uh, from my husband's retirement account at a job that he hasn't worked at, quite frankly, for 12 years. So this hit close to home for our family within the last 24 hours. Um, I, I, I literally couldn't believe it, but I cannot tell a lie. It's a true story. Um, and so what I want to impress upon everyone is that this can happen to anyone and some things that you can do to specifically keep your retirement account uh, in good working order and safe would be to get online and check your account from time to time. A lot of people think that the only reason to get on to your retirement account uh, application, whether it's through Empower or um, Principal, Fidelity, whatever you have, would be if you want to make an investment change, do a fancy contribution change, um, enroll, or request a, a withdrawal. But no, uh, it really is important, I would say at least quarterly, to log into your account and make sure that it is uh, the way that you left it the last time that you were in there. Um, if you comb the transaction history, you'll be able to see maybe any suspicious activity and address it. Um, most of the record keepers have security assurances in place for all of us as retirement plan participants, but some of them request that you notice the potential fraudulent activity within a reasonable time frame. I was reading up again this morning, 90 days seems to be pretty common. So um, if, you, if, if this is something that you don't notice uh, because a check isn't dropped on your doorstep within you know, a reasonable amount of time, it can go unnoticed and the problem can just compile and be exacerbated. So um, enable two-factor uh, uh, authentication on your retirement retirement uh, plan accounts. Um, make sure that your password is unique and long and complicated. And that kind of leads us to a question that came in through the chat, Jay. Do you recommend a password manager? I know you and I were talking before the call today about yeah. LastPass, which is something that yeah. I use and love and just would love your thoughts on a password manager for all these complex passwords that we're asked to keep. Yeah. And again, you know, I, I, I honestly mean, I don't get any endorsement or anything for these companies, but LastPass is a fantastic resource. Any, any company that takes that data integrity, um, they are what's called vault protected. So basically if someone were to crack that encryption, we've got bigger challenges as a society going on right there. I mean, they're, they're using government level encryption on like super classified information. So um, what that also does is it allows you to get crazy with your passwords, have these 50 character things with exclamation points and numbers and zeros and ones and blah, 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 and not have to remember that. And, or even if you remember it, type it out every darn time. So those are fantastic resources because they will autofill for you. And even if you don't go that level, again, most of the devices like uh, Apple and, and, and Windows and others, Google has their encryption there, um, will suggest strong passwords and also archive them in some sort of a keychain or a vault access. Yes, some of those companies have been compromised in the past, but that was all public cloud-based information, not encrypted information. So even that is a step above in terms of security. And then if you really want to go in, something like LastPass is a great example. Anything that is a single sign-on vault mm -hmm. encrypted application is great because it'll allow you to just click a button or touch a screen. It'll log you in and it'll keep all your passwords safe and protected. 
Okay. Great, and I, I noticed earlier in the presentation, we had a whole string of questions come through about freezing your credit, whether or not you would recommend that you do that, not only for us as adults, but would you also recommend something like that for a minor? You know, so that, that is a fantastic question, and I'm really glad that came up. Uh, short deductive answer is absolutely. So okay. I will just tell you, I personally freeze my credit. If I know I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a big purchase or I'm going to be requiring, you know, any sort of a capital restructuring, whatever, I'm going to look at and take any, like anything that would impact my credit, I plan that far in advance and I can unfreeze that. It's not a big deal. Um, and I would absolutely, and that can become a pain in the neck based on where you are in life or what you're trying to do right now. I know a lot of folks are trying to take advantage of refinancing and other things. Fantastic, right? When you know that you don't have anything on the immediate horizon, I would absolutely advocate for freezing your credit. For minors, 100%. 100%. Because what in all likelihood, or, and I use my children as an example, are they going to need access to, you know, why is their credit going to need to be? Now, it did pop when I did open a savings uh, account, deposit account for my oldest daughter. And we connected that in and, and we talked about like how, what else we want her to have access to. They did notice that they're like, oh, well, you know, we, we can't run any sort of inquiries here. I'm like, you don't need to. I'm not asking you to, hurt you to apply for a credit card for her. I'm just simply trying to open a passport account that has access to a card and, and virtual technology. So I know it works because it's been called to my attention. So that's a fantastic uh, practice and I would absolutely advocate for it. Great. And then let's talk about wallets, both digital <laughs> and uh, we all are going to move away from the George Costanza wallet, but I want to share my story about what I bought as a result of our conversation last week. And this is an, help me remember, an RFID. RFID, yes. Right? So, um, you know, I'm not going many places these days. I'm sure many of you aren't either. But when I do, I was carrying just my license and a card loosely in, you know, at the pocket of my purse. And for eight bucks on Amazon, again, not, you know, endorsing or sponsoring this, but it was just a cheap, easy purchase. This is an RFID uh, wallet. So now I have my, you know, max two cards and my driver's license here. I'll slip this in and this will block those cyber criminals if just from walking by me and yeah. scraping my uh, credit card information, right? Yeah. So these are these are tears of joy, by the way. <laughs> the becomes a master. No, I, yeah. and that's and you nailed it. So what this technology does, and it's very very minimal investment on, on any of our behalfs. I make sure all my wallets, my wife's got a, a purse that's lined this way when we travel. Back again when we could travel, um, and and wallets and whatnot is is almost every major manufacturer and even pretty much any manufacturer, you know, Sarah, to your point, it was eight bucks on Amazon. And I think you said you even yep. ordered one for your husband, right? Yep. I'm sure it looks a little different, but yeah. the, they have the RFID blocking technology. So what it does is it stops that signal from leaving that housing that the, that the card is in. Um, most major card issuers now are, are issuing cards in sleeves that have that lining in the sleeve. So even if you don't want to invest in the wallet, when you get a new card, if it comes in one of those sleeves, Take a look at the back of the sleeve and see if it says that it's you know RFID blocking or technology blocking, wireless blocking, whatever they call it, um, based on the 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 the, um, the issuer. Even that is a good practice, right? If you're going to put it in your wallet or put it in your purse and you don't want to invest in a, in a blocking wallet, keep it in the sleeve if they give you one. Um, you can even buy the little sleeves for those of you that are like, well, I don't want to carry a wallet, but maybe I just put a card in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. All right, hey, you know whatever, whatever, whatever you need to to do in that instance, you could buy a sleeve for probably like a buck. I don't, I don't know, I haven't looked at them. Pop the card in there, maybe throw your license in with it, and just pop it in your pocket. You're good to go if you don't want to carry anything bulky. So, but that's a fantastic use of technology to to keep your information safe. Perfect, and I know that a lot of us are now getting these um, new cards. You mentioned them that you just kind of walk up to the register and and it's a no contact transaction, mm -hmm. um, as well as the digital wallets. You mentioned Apple Pay, Google Pay and yeah. things like that. Are these really safer than the physical swipe? Can you help some of us old school folks make, <laughs> make heads or tails of, of these new um, 
You know, I, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, look, is one safer than the other? They say that the, that the technology, especially the tap technology is, is safer. What they're essentially doing in those cards that are my understanding of it. I'm not a, a chief technologist, but I did stay at a holiday Inn once when there was a convention of chief technology officers happening there. Um, what they're doing with that is essentially what Apple and Samsung are doing. They're, they're, you're transmitting data, but you're not transmitting the actual account data. You're transmitting a ghost account data directly to that device. And you're not then, you're also then the other risk that you're avoiding is the, um, the swipe stealing, right? Like the liners that they have, most folks will, you know, when you put your card in and then you like, wait three seconds and pull it out. Um, there are criminals that, in, especially in gas stations or any sort of a terminal, ATMs, for example, in most major metros, that's always a concern. You have to kind of look at it and you have to know what you're looking for. Like, does it look a lot of, a little out of places is there a different color there or something? And they're so good because it's so small, it's really hard to tell. So sometimes when you go in there, they have those skimmers um, that they're called that just line the inside of it. So by just tapping it, you're not putting the card in and it's not skimming directly off the strip. Um, so it is, it is technically safer um for sure but you're still opening yourself up to risk of course but again if it's a credit card you can mitigate that risk a heck of a lot easier and i just noticed in the chat someone had mentioned and thank you for mentioning that a lot of banks and credit unions will give you those sleeves for free so if you call your bank which is a fantastic idea call your bank and say hey just watch this really handsome gentleman and this lovely woman talk about identity theft and i would love for you to send me a technology blocking sleeve for my cards of course, it's going to be in their best interest to do that if they if they have them, which they probably do, because it saves them all the headache of trying to help you if something were to be compromised. So great idea. Thank you for sharing. All right, perfect. So I think with that, we've covered just about as much as we can and even went over today. But I just see from monitoring the participants that we've had a ton of uh, great participation and so many of you that that hung on with us here to the bitter end. So if we happen to not get to your question, I'll go ahead and review the chat transcript and make sure that we try to address that. Um, but again, I want to thank Jay for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your war stories with us today. We certainly appreciate you and our partners at Invesco for supporting our education efforts with our uh, retirement plan participants. Uh, I want to remind everyone once again that this presentation uh, will be available on SRP's YouTube page by the end of the week and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording. So uh, be a steward of this information, share it with family, friends, co-workers, uh, neighbors, and let's um, all help try to keep each other safe. The next presentation in the 2021 uh, SRP education series will be uh, Tuesday, May 11th. So stay tuned for an invitation for that where we'll talk about being financially focused and what that means um, for you in 2021. So once again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jay, and everyone stay safe and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.